SBC Media. Welcome to iGaming Daily, analysing the news from the betting and gaming industry all over the globe. Supported by SBC Summit Barcelona, the industry-leading conference bringing you the future of sports betting and iGaming. Discover the potential of Latin America's booming iGaming and sports betting markets at SBC Summit Latin America, the premier industry event in the region. Join SPC at the Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Miami from October 31st to November the 2nd. Register now at spcevents.com. The gaming industry has been fanatical about fanatics since the second wave sportsbook has started to roll out in the U.S. What was already an intriguing proposition, though, is turning into some salacious gossip as DraftKings has entered a second bid to compete with Fanatic's offer to purchase the U.S. arm of points bet. The $195 million offer is 30% higher than the one put forth by Fanatic's, but is currently non-binding. However, DraftKings has persuaded points bet to at least entertain their bid in advance of a June 30th vote by the points bet board. On today's episode of iGaming Daily, we'll break down the drama and try to read the tea leaves on the future of points bet U.S., I'm Jessica Wellman, editor of SBC Americas, joined by my senior journalist, Charlie Horner, who you've been on the points bet beat all year. So uh, I feel like I should just I should mute my mic and turn it over to you for a 20 minute monologue. But I'll pepper you with some questions, too. Yeah, it's, it's been uh, it's been a, a good a good story to cover. Everyone loves m a stories and uh you know, when 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 one deal turns into a competition and a little bit of a bidding war, it's always exciting. So uh, it's been good to good to cover. Now I know we talked about the first offer, um, the Fanatics offer for points bet, but refresh the memory of people. What are the two offers and kind of the key differences between the two? So listeners will remember when we spoke about the points bet and Fanatics deal uh, a few weeks ago. So. Uh, Fanatics is offering $150 million for the U.S. business, uh, notably not the Canadian section, which would stay with the Australian parent company. Um, so that would include market access into 14 states, 35% of the U.S. adult population. It would also cover the... We need to agree on the pronunciation of this word. Is it banach? Banach. Is it banach? <laughs> banach, well, banach, banach. Who knows? Who knows? But that you technology. Said Banak, Bannock, I think you said. I like that one. That sounds fun. So Bannock it is. Bannock technology, which um is a highly regarded um piece of technology that Points Bet has, has got, and also a license to use Points Bet's proprietary technology as well. Uh now DraftKings has, has come in with this counter offer or just New offer this uh, late last week um, at 195 million dollars, which I think is a 30 percent premium on Fanatics' offer. It's important to note though that this is a non-binding agreement. Um, this could change. There's no definitive agreement here. Um, DraftKings are not legally obliged to follow through with any of this, and. The more specific terms haven't really been laid out in terms of is Canada involved in this deal? Is it just the US? Is it the Bannock Tech? What? what no one knows of specifics of this deal, and that's what's causing so much intrigue. I think uh, the NBC deal, I assume as well, is kind of up in the air on that one. Yeah, we can only assume so. Yeah. So Fanatics agreed to take that on, but we again, we don't know. Uh, what's what's in the uh, fine print of the DraftKings proposal. Okay, so we, to me, <laughs> it's pretty obvious what Fanatic stands to gain from this acquisition. You get 14 states market access that sure, you could go in and get those deals for market entry in most of those states, New York being the exception. Um, the tech obviously would improve the same game parlay tech for either company. What does DraftKings really stand to gain out of this, though? Uh, to me, it's just being a obstructionist. To be honest, it's like, well, you stand to slow down the entry of what could be a substantial competitor. Is there anything else the company really would be getting out of this? Well, I think this is the thing. Everyone's been saying, well, Fanat uh, DraftKings are out to block Fanatics. If they can maybe stall this deal from happening, maybe... 
after the NFL season, that would be a win for them because Fanatics, like you say, could be a big competitor. And if they can delay a, a huge launch in 14 states before the NFL season, which is Fanatics' target, um, that would be seen as a win for DraftKings. However, that's not the official DK story. They yeah. are... Yeah, I doubt that. They're like, we just feel like being <laughs> jerks, man. Um, what is their official story? Yeah, they're very eager to say that this is not a defensive deal and that this is something that they see real value in. They think that the valuation of point bet is a positive for them. They think that maybe the $195 million at that valuation, it's not something they can turn down um, because, you know, points bet do have a significant number of users, players, that that TAM, the 35% TAM. Could he, the, the, the points bet players added onto the existing DraftKings players could maybe get DraftKings a little bit closer to Fangio, you know, nationwide. So that's potentially where, where they're looking for the gains. I mean, that that does make sense. Uh, right now, points bet is the seventh largest sports book in the nation. Uh, lots of presence in many states. You would assume DraftKings shutters the brand and they don't, you know, continue to operate too. Flutter in some states has done Fox Bet and FanDuel, but that was kind of because pre-FanDuel acquisition, they had rolled out Fox Bet. You see that they don't do that in other states. I, I think the question then becomes, what is the funnel of getting these points bet customers over to DraftKings? And is it as A to B as the DraftKings argument makes it? Um I think personally, I think you still have to incentivize them in in one way or another. If you've got a loyal points bet customer, why would they go over to DraftKings? What are you going to give them? I don't think that they're going to be won over by like, oh, hey, that tech company we can't pronounce is now part of DraftKings. So you might want to come bet over here now. Um, If same game parlays are what you're after, that's kind of FanDuel's bread and butter right now. So I, I question that 7% of the, or not 7%, but that points bets market share is just going to full load port over to um, DraftKings. It's already existed in the market. If people had wanted to play it, they would have played it at this point in time. Exactly. I mean, DraftKings is such a big player in the US. You've got to question why those players who are with points bet now weren't already DraftKings players and why they chose points bet brand over DraftKings. Uh, so I think you're right. Um, I don't think it's necessarily the case that people will think, oh, well, points bets now DraftKings. I guess I'll bet with DraftKings. I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. Whereas, you know, Fanatics, I think you probably could make more of an argument that you are replacing one with another in something that is new and you haven't seen before, that I can see that conversion happening at, at a higher rate. But... Um, you know, I, I don't, it, it would help. I'm sure it would boost DraftKings market share, but I doubt it's going to be an exact, you know, it, it's never going to be a hundred percent, but you have to question um, the full impact of it. I also just have to question, you know, DraftKings is kind of turning into Peter and the wolf a little with these acquisition offers because, they did recall make I, I believe it was a twenty two billion dollar offer for Entain. Wasn't that the number? It would have been yeah something astronomical like that. Um, but yeah, the, like you say, they've got track a track record for this, uh, trying to be a disruptor as well as a, a big brand uh, in the industry. And yeah, that that makes you sort of question: Is this really a, a genuine offer, or or is it you know kicking the can down the road for fanatics? I mean, it's a good question. I, I, and I'll be honest, I wasn't following the Entain DraftKings story as closely when that was happening, um, just because that wasn't my beat. I may not have even been in the industry. <laughs> I mean, on the writing side of the industry at the moment, I can't remember the exact dates. But, you know, the the $22 billion offer was eventually rescinded. They said, you know, after discussions with leadership, it just didn't make sense. But it also was at the time that BetMGM was coming on the scene very, very hard. They are a joint venture between Entain and 
and MGM that it did kind of feel like a somewhat of an obstructionist move that would have had a lot of issues on the MGM side um, about potentially getting through that it just the the similarities you have to call attention to i think no i think i think you're absolutely right there yeah i think the the parallels are quite stark the other question i have like just how solvent is draftkings at this point in time they're carrying an enormous amount of debt we've seen that they are capable of raising capital but I mean, $195 million for this offer, which may or may not include other things um, like the NBC offer, which would potentially, you know, that's an offer you have to, a deal you have to keep paying into. Uh, you have to question how much money DraftKings would have left if if this offer went through. Well, this is something that Michael Rubin, the CEO of Fanatics, uh, was pointed out late last week when when the DraftKings offer first came to light, he claims, and of course he's going to claim this because he's on, on the opposite side, that the financial obligation of DraftKings to see out this deal for the rest of the year would be around $500 million. And he, he says that that's the majority of DraftKings cash reserves for, for the rest of this year. So yeah, I mean, we've, we've, we've always talked about DraftKings and you know the amount of money that they lose the amount of debt that it holds. Um, so it would be a, a risky move to, 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 you know, go for or commit $500 million to the seventh largest uh, operator in the country. So yeah, it's going to be, it, it'll be, it'd be interesting to see if they follow through with it and what impact that it would have on its full year financials. Because obviously DraftKings are looking at hitting profitability later this year uh, and certainly going into next year as well. So they claim uh, whether that happens or not will, will, remains to be seen. If you do this deal, so much for that plan, right? <laughs> it, it's not going to pay for itself right away. If you look at DraftKings stock too, um, June 16th, which I believe last Friday was when the deal was announced, right? Sorry, Canada brain. Um <laughs> that it did drop a, a couple of dollars from, you know, it was at a high of $26.14 on Tuesday down to $24.51 on Friday, that this isn't something that the shareholders are that excited about, it seems like, given uh, it's not some massive plummet, but it is worth noting it wasn't something that generated an uptick in the valuation of the company uh, in the terms of stockholders yeah i think the big topic has been when is DraftKings going to actually make some money and i think q1 results actually gave people a little bit of optimism and a little bit of hope um but like you say if, if this deal was to go through and it was to be finalized then you could probably kiss goodbye to any hopes of full year profit for this year yeah i mean if you look at, at year to date stock numbers where they started the year at you know eleven dollars uh, and we're up to 25, that they are, you know, um, trending on an upward tick. But it's been a minute since they've done something like this. It's been kind of quiet on the M&A front this year, to be honest. So uh, the fact that there's suddenly competitive bids for this company is certainly something to keep an eye on. So they're up against a deadline, correct? There's going to be a vote on June 30th. And DraftKings has to get points bet to buy into this offer prior to that vote, correct? Yes. So, I mean, this is this could be a fast moving story and things could develop, um, you know, before next week or before yeah, the, the 30th of June. But for uh, points bet headquarters in Australia have an extraordinary general meeting next Friday, the 30th of June where shareholders will vote on the Fanatics offer. Um, so they'll be looking for, for approval because the board of directors, despite the DraftKings offer, is still recommending that shareholders push through the Fanatics deal. And you just think that really that is security, that if the DraftKings deal does fall through, then at least they are still going to recover some value. Makes sense. All right. Say, say this does go DraftKings way. Let's talk about what that means for fanatics. We are, it's June 22nd. So we are essentially, 
ballpark 10 weeks out from the start of the NFL season. Right now they are in beta in, ah, I should have looked this up, five states? Four? I believe so. Uh, Ohio, Massachusetts, Tennessee. Um, um, Maryland. Maryland, yeah. So I think at four. Four. Okay. They're still in beta, still not full rollout. The numbers we're seeing, it's it's about a hundred grand in handle, uh, I think, in Massachusetts was what it was, and then about two fifty in Ohio. This is without a marketing push. This is a very intentionally limited rollout. They have yet to fully roll out the product anywhere. And we're looking at in terms of switching over licensing. New York has said, you know, it would just be a matter of of vetting the key stakeholders and that transfer of license shouldn't be too difficult. But if you have to go back to the drawing board and you have to get market access in states where you thought you had market access handled, um, I, I do question the ability to get that done in 10 weeks. Yes. Um, you know, Fanatics has, has been an outlier in the fact that it's a late mover. It's taken a slow, methodical approach to its launch. It's gone into beta in all these states, trying to really refine the product, test it out, um, and, and make those adjustments. I, I, in my opinion, to make sure the product is optimal for a big push uh, for the NFL season. And I think even before the points bet deal was even made public, they they made it known that they wanted to roll out in up to 15 states by the NFL season. So I think that was always the internal target is that they were going to make a big push in sort of Q3, Q4. But yeah, like you say, if those licensing um, terms ends up being a little bit trickier than initially thought, then it, 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 could, um, it could cause some problems. And it could mess up their whole strategy for the year. Um, it's, so there's a lot riding on this, on, on the shareholder vote next week. And there's a lot riding on what happens in, in the weeks and months following. Yeah. I mean, if you have to punt on football season, it would be a, a huge detriment to what you're doing. Um, it, truly, I, you, I cannot overemphasize how important August and September are in terms of customer acquisition for operators. You'll see it in Massachusetts and in Ohio. You'll see those numbers just hugely curve back up again because it is instead of the playoffs and like four or five football games to care about, you have the full slate of 16 again, plus college football that missing out on that would be a a huge loss for the company. I mean, right now you have to think about too, most gaming control boards meet monthly Um, So anything that requires a face-to-face meeting where they need to do a transfer of license, you have a finite number of meetings to do that. Some states will allow you to call a special meeting and that sort of thing. And certainly paperwork is probably being filed in all of these states in advance of things. But even this June 30th vote and deadline is putting you on a short timeline. And anything that that pushes that back is going to really put you up against the wall when it comes to meeting uh, a week one launch date. So something to keep an eye on. Certainly uh, keep an eye on SBC America's next Friday for news from that vote. In the meantime, what else is going on over on our site, Charlie, that you think people should be paying attention to? Well, let's stick with the sports book theme um, because Bally's yesterday has announced that it's closed its Bally Bets app um, for the summer whilst it completes its migration over to the Canby platform. Um, and Except then... in Arizona. Arizona, they are staying operational. I also don't know for Ontario. Um, I was unclear if that's going to continue operations as well. There are two versions of the app out there. Um, there's a version that was like 1.0, very much on the Betworks platform. And then there's a more games as forward version that went live in Arizona that I I think that has something to do with the tech and the switch. It may be a regulatory thing too, though, that you're not allowed to to shutter your sports book in some states. And then I think another big story that's 
that's sort of come around this week is, and certainly one to keep an eye on in, in the weeks and months to come is the potential raising of the tax rate over in Ohio because senators have proposed doubling the tax rate to 20%, right? Yeah, uh, this was a proposition that Governor Mike DeWine had put forth earlier in the year that the House did not take up when it passed a version of the budget. Now the Senate version does have that back in it, and they're going to conference committee with both House and Senate to try to meet the end of the month budget deadline. Uh, Speaker of the House has said there's a chance that they do not meet that deadline. They need to do so in order to have a budget for fiscal year 23-24, What I really want to emphasize on this is this is not like a single bill about the sports betting tax. This is literally a 9,000 page document that is the entire budget for the entire state with a lot of things in it that are kind of controversial that, uh, I mean, you have to wonder on the bartering of this, who, you know, how high a value Governor DeWine is putting on getting this tax rate through or if it's something that he's willing to dump. In an, in an attempt to get something else that maybe he cares about more. And I think also there's there's the fact that, you know, in the grand scheme of things, sports betting politically isn't a charged um, topic. So maybe it's something that you it just gets glossed over in, you know, in exchange for something like health or education or something like that. that um, yeah, something- I mean, it's tough as a lawmaker. I, I don't know how many lawmakers are really like, we should tax gambling operations less. You know, it's not a stance that is all that common unless you, you know, are getting lobbying dollars that I don't know who's dying on that hill uh, to get it back down to 10% on the flip side of things. I I don't know who's going to really push for that to be something uh, versus make the concession. If they did do that, they would have one of the higher tax rates in the nation. They would be up there with Massachusetts in that they would be at 20% with no promo deductions. When you look at uh, rates that are higher than that, uh, New York doesn't allow promo deductions, obviously, but that's the the rare outlier. Uh, Pennsylvania does allow promo deductions. So it would be a materially different situation. So far, the state has gotten $45 million from sports betting in the first, I think we're through, we haven't gotten May yet, I don't think, in Ohio. So through four months, $45 million, not too shabby. Uh, Keep an eye out when those numbers do come out. We will certainly have them. Uh, And then I've got a our final looking sharp of the season coming up today on SBC Americas. If you guys want to take a look, talking with Sport Trade about how they kind of pivoted their product, how it originally came out as this Robin Hood stock tradey kind of app and how they realized that line shopping and in-game betting was more where they needed to go. It was a really interesting conversation, so keep an eye for that. And in the meantime, enjoy the weekend, and we'll see who else puts a bid for points bet in by the time the vote gets around on Friday. In the meantime, we will see you next time on iGaming Daily. Thank you for listening to today's episode of iGaming Daily, brought to you in conjunction with SBC Summit Barcelona, being held at the FIRA Barcelona Monduic on the 19th to the 21st of September. If you want to find out more about some of the subjects raised today, feel free to explore any of the sites in the SBC News Network or check out the latest edition of the SBC Leaders magazine. Happy reading.